Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Well, let's read our four verses again, okay? We're not doing that many verses. Can we open to 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 20? Verses about Benaiah. Our theme at this afternoon session is going to be seizing opportunities. And if you could take an example of seizing opportunities that we are going to look at, Sister Linda's prophecy about Jael, when Sisera came into her tent, she gave him warm milk, she put him to sleep, and took the opportunity to win a battle. All she had was a stake, but she seized the moment, took the opportunity, and won a battle. And that's where we're going today, exactly what you heard from that prophecy. 2 Samuel 23 and verse 20, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, a valiant fighter from Kabzeel, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And he struck down a huge Egyptian. Although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaiah went against him with a club, snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand, and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. He too was as famous as the three mighty warriors. He was held in greater honor than any of the 30, but he was not included among the three. And David put him in charge of his bodyguard. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for those examples in scripture that can help us in our walk, help us in our journey, help us to be effective, help us to be the men and women of God that you desire. And we pray that you would speak to us today, you would instill courage in us today, you will open our eyes to see things that maybe we have not seen. We pray in Jesus' name. Je Benaiah that day, on different days, we could say it that way, he had an opportunity and he had two choices. He could have waited for better circumstances. When it came to the, the two Moabites, he could have said, if I can get them each alone, I'll fight them, I'll have a better chance at success. But he had an opportunity that day to go to battle with the Moabites. And even though the odds were against him, he seized his opportunity and won a battle. The same thing with the lion. He easily could have said, I'm going to wait till there's reinforcements. If there's two or three of us, we might be able to get this lion. Or we'll wet, wait till they bring a net. But he saw an opportunity. And we have to realize opportunities do not come along at our behest. They are a gift from God, and we have got to seize them. That's why when you think of even what we heard about J.L., she had a one-time shot, Sisera in her tent. It probably would never have been repeated. And we have to seize those moments, not look at the circumstances, not think of maybe it will be better in the future. The future may never come. That's why, and I've shared this already in seminar, but the stories in their back-to-back -back in Luke 18 and 19, that one is the story of blind Bartimaeus. We know that he was on the roadside, he was begging, he heard that Jesus was going by, and he cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And the people around him said, that's the master, be quiet, don't talk so loud. And he shouted out even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me, and Jesus heard him and responded, and he received his sight. What he did not know is that Jesus was going to Jerusalem. Jesus would be crucified in another week, and Bartimaeus would never have had that opportunity again. The ramifications are incredible. If you look at the story, Bartimaeus most likely would have died blind if he had not seized that moment to cry out even louder. And it makes me wonder about myself. Would I have listened to the people 
saying, be quiet, you're out of order, you are too loud, or would I have bucked what the decency called for and shouted out a little more? I don't know the answer. I don't want to presume. I know what I'd like to think I would do, but that doesn't always work that way. The next story, immediately after, is the story of Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was short. Zacchaeus knew that Jesus was passing by. And it's the same situation. Jesus is going to Jerusalem. He's never going to pass that way again. And Zacchaeus has Jesus passing by. He's too short to see him. And he hikes up his robe. He runs ahead and he climbs a tree. Chief tax collectors don't climb trees. They are too dignified. But what does he do? He sees an opportunity. I can see Jesus. I can see Jesus today, and I don't care how stupid I look. I don't care how ridiculous I look. I am going to climb that tree, and this is my opportunity. Think if he had said, no, I'm not climbing a tree. Too many people look up to me. He would have died in his sins, from what we know. You know, seizing opportunities. It's like with uh, Benaiah. You know, lions, we don't get to choose when we meet them. That lion might have gone up into the mountain and not been seen again for six months. Benaiah had an opportunity to rescue the people around him. And though it was a snowy day, though it was less than ideal, he took the opportunity. He seized the moment. We have got to be impressed today to look for opportunities, to seize them when we come, when we see them, to seize them, and to pray that God would open our eyes to see them. I was thinking as I was writing out my notes, opportunities all look different. I was driving down the road one day, and it was a terrible rainstorm. It was pouring as hard as it ever poured. And I went by a bus stop, and there were some people standing in the pouring rain at the bus stop. And God said, give them your umbrella. And I just said, oh, Lord, that's my good umbrella. And I drove past, and the Lord was not happy. And so I turned around, went back down the road, turned around again, pulled up in front of them, rolled down the window, handed them my umbrella and said, I hope this helps a little bit. But it was an opportunity, and I felt the Lord saying this, you skip this one, don't count on another one. In other words, if you won't do what I say today, don't count on one tomorrow. And I knew that it mattered to God. The, the cost of a little umbrella was meaningless. The cost of disobedience was monumental. And then one other time, we, we have people, much like here, older people, that will sit by stoplights and, and have a, a change jar, and they'll be begging uh, for help. They'll have signs, you know, please give me food. And I, as I drove up, going by somebody, the Lord said, give them something. And the light had turned green, and I didn't want to miss the light. And like rebellious Pastor Joe sometimes, I kept going. I drove about a half mile, and oh, God was mad. So I turned around once again, drove, and I had to go far. I had to go all the way around this huge block, came back, and obeyed the Lord. We need that kind of mentality that God's opportunities are so valuable that we don't want to pass them up. Zacchaeus and Bartimaeus makes us wonder, as we said, what would we have done in those situations? Ephesians 5 and verse 16, it says, make the most of every opportunity because we might not get them again. In November of 2021, during the pandemic, I had a best friend from high school, from eighth grade actually, that we had lived together, been friends. He was the best man in my wedding, Richard Yeager. He had multiple sclerosis for many, many years, some serious health problems. And it lined up in November of 2021 that I had the opportunity to drive about six hours to spend an afternoon with Richard. And I drove six hours, we sat on his couch, 
Uh, his muscles had deteriorated to where they had to lay the wheelchair down because his neck, he didn't have a muscle to lift it, so they laid him down so he could see you. We spent three hours telling old stories of travels and vacations and pranks we play, played in high school and sports that we did together. And months later, two months later, I called to see if I could go again because it was such a rewarding experience. And his wife said he's too weak. Two days later, he passed away. But I tell you what, the opportunity to drive 12 hours to spend three hours with Richard was one of the most priceless things that I can remember. You know, it wasn't a burden. It was an opportunity. And I can tell you this, we talked about regrets yesterday. If I had passed that up, if I had been too busy, if the cost of gas was too high, it would have been a regret for a missed opportunity. I was in the Holmes' apartment on Sunday night waiting for uh, dinner. Mrs. Holmes was cooking, and there's a little book by the side table. And as I do with books so often, I open to the middle. When I go into a bookstore, I open to one page in the middle. If I like that one page, I buy the book. If I don't like that one page, I put it back. It's, I've done it for 30 years. It's a ridiculous habit. I love doing it. So, so I go into the Holmes apartment. I take out this book, and I open it up to a page in the middle. And it's the story of a lady named Joan Lindemann. Joan and her husband, Don, had been married for 40 years. At the end of those 40 years, Don contracted Alzheimer's. And as he deteriorated, she had to put him in a nursing home 20 miles away. And Joan tell, tells the story in the article from that book. And she said, every afternoon, I made the round trip to spend time with him, to talk with him, to care for him. She said, I was committed to him. And one morning, he had been healthy, everything was fine. One morning, she was on the phone with her son, and in the middle of the phone call, she felt an urge, the, the promptings of the Holy Spirit. She felt an urge that said, you better go see Don. And, and she said, okay, Lord. She hung up the phone. It rang again with her daughter-in-law. She said, I can't talk. I've got to go. She drove quickly to the nursing home. And when she got in, they said, come into the room quickly. Don is ill. Something is wrong. He had a fever. He was sweating. She sat down next to him, held his hand, talked to him, and she was there at that moment when he died. You know, seizing an opportunity can be as small as listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, where he wants us to go, who he wants us to talk to, what he wants us to do. And what an amazing story, because I think we would all count precious being with a loved one when they passed away. Being with someone that you've been married to for 40 years and spent all of your time together. She was there at the right time. There's stories in the natural, there's stories in the spiritual. I'm drinking a Starbucks coffee not to rub it in, not to torture you, but because I'm about to talk about Starbucks. <laughs> Howard Schultz, August 15th, 1987, was given the opportunity to purchase a small chain of coffee shops in a city in the US, Seattle, Washington. He went back and forth as to whether he should do it. It was an opportunity that was more than he wanted to spend and the asking price was $4 million. He said this in his own words. He said, this is my moment, I thought. If I don't seize the opportunity, his words, not mine, if I don't seize the opportunity, if I don't step out of my comfort zone and risk it all, if I let too much time pass by, my moment will pass. I knew if I didn't take advantage of this opportunity, I would replay it in my mind for the rest of my life. He signed on and bought Starbucks. His goal was to open one more coffee shop in a city south of, south of Seattle, Portland, Oregon. 
The $4 million investment five years later was worth $273 million, and that was 1992. Now we have Americans in Antipolo drinking Starbucks coffee in a seminar. Isn't that beautiful? Coming up with excuses to drink coffee is really hard, <laughs> I have to say. This one took, I had to change all of my notes around. Okay, I'm done. He sees the moment. He sees the opportunity. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1, if you want to turn in your Bibles, I realize in a gathering of leaders that you know these scriptures, but in Exodus 3 and verse 1, Moses had fled from Egypt when he had killed an Egyptian. He had tried to settle a dispute between, between two Israelites he had been shepherding his father-in-law's sheep for 40 years in the wilderness. In chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, came to Horeb the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. And he thought, I will go over. I will turn aside and see this strange sight, why the bush did not burn up. We know that Moses had for 40 years been a leader trained in Pharaoh's house when he was spoken of in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen spoke of him. He said this was a man educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, powerful in speech and action, 40 years removed from that splendor. He sees a bush on fire and turns aside to look at it. But verse, verse 4 is the key. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look at it, God was looking for a reaction. God was looking to see if Moses would respond, if he had still had an interest in something new, if he was still open to God moving in his life. When the Lord saw that Moses turned aside, we don't know what would have happened if Moses hadn't turned aside, but I'm thinking he would have missed his moment. I'm thinking that was his seize-the-moment opportunity to reconnect with God. What hinged on it was 40 more years of leading 2 million people through the wilderness to the promised land. But it hinged on that moment of turning aside. Not all positive stories when it comes to seizing the moment. Rehoboam succeeded his father Solomon. And Solomon at the end of his reign had been cruel and hard on those who were under him. And when Rehoboam took the throne, they came to him and said, your father was hard on us. How are you going to treat us? Because that will determine if we're going to stay loyal to you. And Rehoboam called for counselors. And the old men came in and said, praise God for old men. I mean, hey, hey, how, can you say amen? amen? We're not responding enough. I mean, But the old, older men, that's better. Right? Is that better? The, the pre-retirement men <laughs> came in and they said, listen, Rehoboam, if you will be easier on them, they will serve you and you will, you, you will, you'll have them as your servants. And then the younger men came in and they said, oh no, they'll think less of you. You tell them that you're going to be even harder than your father was on them. And when they came back for an answer, he answered them harshly. He didn't seize the opportunity to keep the kingdom together. He had an opportunity to rescue his own future as a leader. And he let it pass by by listening to the wrong counsel. Benaiah's path crossed the lion that day. He could easily have said, I'm going to wait till it's not snowing. 
I'm going to wait till the weather's a little better. It won't be so slippery. I'll have a better chance. But he seized the moment. He seized the opportunity when he met that lion. God causes us to be in the right place at the right time with the right people. But we have to respond to the opportunities he creates. God does his part, but we have to do ours. In every situation, there is God's sovereignty and there is man's responsibility. God creates opportunities. It's up to us to recognize them. It's up to us to respond to them. Benaiah responded. We see Moses responded. But we see Rehoboam not responding. And we can see that in so many situations. God strategically positions us. But the right places often look like the wrong places. The right time, snowy day with a lion in a pit, often looks like the wrong time. God's opportunities will include inconvenience, interruption, ruining our plans. We've got something wonderful planned, and God says, I want you to go minister to this person. I want you to respond to this need in a life. And I think how appropriate that we talk about it today. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 1. As we've heard stories of revival breaking out in different places, different college campuses in the U.S. and starting to spread to other nations, when it first happened, God spoke to me out of Zechariah, one very simple verse, but it's a seize the opportunity verse. Zechariah 10.1 says, Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. And what the Lord spoke is, when you begin to see me moving, you begin to see rain falling in places around the world, that's the time to go to prayer. That's the time to ask for rain. That's the time to put other things aside. Call for special prayer meetings. Go after God in a new and a fresh way. When you see the rain falling, ask God to send rain on you. The time to respond and seize the moment. We're at a unique time in the church. God is moving in different places. You heard the story from Brother Norm about their grandson being healed, in part from going to revival services. This is a time to seize the opportunity, whatever that might mean. We just, held, we just did a couple extra prayer meetings. We added Friday night prayer meetings from 7 to 9 o'clock to say, Lord, we want to be a part. Lord, we want to see your reign. We're talking about seize the opportunity. And it's wonderful to throw an umbrella and to put some money into a box. But God's calling us to be men and women who bring change and see revival and see the loss brought in and see lives changed. Ask the Lord for rain. Seize the opportunity for this moment that we're in. If we just do same old, same old, and we hope God will show up Sunday morning, we don't do anything different, but we hope that Sunday's awesome because God's moving at Asbury. I'm not so sure it's the right approach. It's going after God with all our heart. Asking the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. Revival, as we talk about it and experience it, will always interrupt our plans. Reading the stories at Asbury of four and 5,000 people in a small town where there were more visitors than there were people, there were not enough restrooms to, for all of the visitors, there were not enough restaurants to feed people, they had people out on the lawn because the overflow rooms were all full. When God moves in revival, he will interrupt our plans, our neatly ordained services, perfectly scheduled. Our agendas will be ripped up and thrown out, and God will have free reign. But we have to seize those moments, seize the opportunities for more of God. One man said, the chance of a lifetime is not something to take lightly. You know, this is a time that the last revival at Asbury happened in 1970. It happened 50 
two years ago, 53 years ago. God moves in his sovereign timing. And when he moves, we want to seize those chances and go after God. Amen? Ken Engel, the former president of Southeastern University, said moments of difficulty enable us to see God's provision. Moments of difficulty create the opportunity for God to prove his faithfulness. Every problem you and I face. We're going to look at this in more detail tonight. That will be our theme. But every problem that we face is an opportunity for God to prove that he loves us, an opportunity for God to prove he is more than capable of meeting our every need, seizing and seeing every opportunity, opportunities to pray. You know, God, God wants us to, to more than tell people we'll pray for them, to pray for them. Rather than saying, I'll pray for you when, when I'm in church, say, can we pray right now? To seize the moments, not for them to wonder if you prayed, to hear you pray. To seize the moment to laugh with some people. There's some pretty depressed people around. There's some people going through some hard situations. There's some people in real difficulty. If you get a chance, make them laugh. If you get an opportunity, pull out your best joke. Pull out a knock-knock joke you got from your grandchildren. I mean, let, no, I'm being real. You wanted something far more spiritual, didn't you? You know, Hebrew says, think about how you can stir others up. Think about how you can encourage other people. Scripture says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Uh, how do we get a merry heart? We tell funny stories. We laugh about mistakes we've made and embarrassing things we've done. We tell people how a goofy speaker drank Starbucks in front of us. We do whatever it takes. Seize the opportunity to act. Seize opportunities to trust God. When, when, when it's like, Lord, I don't know what's next. I can't find the job that I want. There's bills coming up. Seize the opportunity to trust God. Turn it into prayer. Seize the opportunity to love someone else. There's a deficiency in the world around us. There's a deficiency in love. People are looking to be loved, to know that someone cares, to know that someone is on their side. If you get a chance to spend extra time with someone, whether it's sitting around chatting after seminar, after a service, going out to coffee, the opportunity to love someone is precious. And it's not some light little thing like, oh, thank you for that. No, you can change a life by loving them. Someone knowing that you care. To smile, to pray. Colossians 4 and verse 5. Colossians talks about, begins that verse with be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. But then Paul goes on in verse 5. He says, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. He said that in Ephesians, the exact words. And here he repeats it to another church. And he said, Listen, opportunities are precious. Make the most of them. Now, I can tell you as a parent, when I remind my kids and say the same thing over and over, it's because, number one, it's important, and number two, they tend to forget. And here's Paul talking to Christians, and he's saying, listen, make the most of every opportunity. A needed reminder. But that chapter, verse 4, begins talking about how masters treat slaves and then in verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. And there is a connection between prayer and opportunity. And what happens is the more we pray, the more our eyes are opened to see the opportunities that come before us. 
A person who doesn't pray, a person who has no prayer life, a person who never speaks in tongues, their ability to catch opportunities is limited, whereas someone who prays, the opportunities come before them. Even when they're at the wrong times, even when they're in times that are inappropriate, times that are inconvenient, in the wrong places, they still respond to them. And so we can talk all we want about opportunities, but your prayer life will determine seeing opportunities and how you respond to them. And that's true for each one of us here. The Chinese word crisis is made up of two characters. One character means danger. The other character means opportunity. And what, a, what an amazing thing that problems... Crises are opportunities in disguise, opportunities to trust the Lord, to exercise our faith, to respond and do what God has called us to do. The English word opportunity, it comes from the Latin phrase, it's two words, ab portu. O-B is the first word, P-O-R-T-U for those taking notes, ab portu. And what it means is this, that in the day be, days before modern harbors, when ships had to wait till flood tide to make it into port, they waited, and when the tide came in, they rode the tide into the shore. In those days, the phrase ab portu meant that it referred to that moment in time when the tide shifted, and they lifted anchors and rode the tide in. And if they missed it, they had to wait for the next tide to go in, to go out. Ab portu. It's, it's riding the tide of opportunity that comes to us. We looked at Esther yesterday from the risk side, but we can look at Esther from the opportunity side. The scripture says in Esther 4.13, Who knows but that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. She had an opportunity to make a difference. She had an opportunity to save her people. But it's like that Chinese wo word. It's danger and it's opportunity. It's both together. Prayer turns problems into opportunity. Prayer, that little Latin phrase, ab portu, prayer turns the tide of what is going on in our lives and it's wide-ranging. We can, we can look at the areas even of repentance, not interacting with anybody else, us and God. And, and I'm sure we all know by now, we can't repent of something we've done at just any time. We can't wait till we've got our fill of sin and then say, I will repent when. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19 in the King James, it says, repent therefore, and converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. When God is dealing with you about something not right, don't put it off. Don't think there'll be a more convenient time. Like the king said to, uh, uh, to Paul, he said, I'll, I'll meet with you at a more convenient time. And it appears they never met again. Repentance is seizing the moment when God is heavy on your heart. So many think that they can do it on their own schedule, and it doesn't work that way. One of the sad missed opportunity stories is in Numbers 13 and 14. We know that the children of Israel had been in the wilderness for two years, and after two years they came to Kadesh Barnea, Moses sent out the 12 spies, and they brought back a report. Two of them brought back a cluster of grapes so large that it was held, and two of them had to carry it. But when they came back, the 10 spies persuaded the people that the giants were too big and they would be destroyed. The 10 spies gave such a negative report that they decided not to enter in and refused to follow what God had said. And God's judgment fell 
on the 10 people that gave the negative report. And when everyone saw these 10 people laying dead, judged by God, they said, we've changed our mind, Moses. We're going to go into the promised land. We'll be ready first thing in the morning. And the next morning they got up and they presumed that the opportunity was still there. They presumed that tomorrow was as good as today. And the story is told and it says they attempted to go in the battle and the enemy drove them back and defeated them because opportunities don't exist on our timetable. Opportunities exist on God's timetable. What's crazy, they had to wait 38 years for the next opportunity. Those that Joshua and Caleb even, that brought back a good report, still had to wait 38 years for the next opportunity to enter into what they could have gotten into in two years. 38 more years of wandering through a wilderness. 38 more years of being in a dry and barren land outside of what God had promised. They missed their day of opportunity, tried to extend it one day. They tried to say, Lord, we're going to do it tomorrow. And God said, oh, no, you won't. Let's take serious the opportunities God gives us. If it's to reach out to someone else, if it's to make something right, if it's to call someone and apologize and say, listen, I'm sorry I did that. Please forgive me. Respond to the opportunities that we get, even if it means humbling ourselves, even if it means interrupting our schedule. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus told the parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. And we know the story. Five of them took extra oil for their lamp. Five did not. When the time came that they were to enter into the feast. The five that had not taken extra oil tried to borrow from the five that had, and they said, no, we won't have enough. And while they were gone, the bridegroom came, the five wise entered in. But their opportunity, and I think this is crucial, their opportunity was in the preparation stage. Their opportunity was not when the bridegroom showed up. Their opportunity was the day before to get ready. I'll say this to the graduating students of ZMI, first-year students, really to every one of us, but there are opportunities to study, and we better take advantage of them. There are opportunities to read. We better take advantage of them. There are opportunities to pray. We better take advantage of them. There's, we've been given the, the gift, hopefully every here, everyone here, of the Holy Spirit. Jude 20 says, building yourself up in the most Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues and strengthening yourselves. We better take advantage of that because the strength that is needed for tomorrow may be found in the preparations of today. The five foolish virgins did not seize their opportunity. You could say this, well, there was no opportunity. There was nowhere to go in. No, there was an opportunity to prepare, to fill your lamp with oil, to be ready for what was ahead the next day, and they refused to do it. We've got to be those that know that sometimes our opportunity presents itself in preparation. Opportunity comes, Stephen Jacob said, to those who are prepared. Opportunity comes to those who are prepared. I I had one habit that I still laugh at sometimes, but the first church that I was in, Brother Norman and Sister Linda had been there before me. The pastor had some health problems and often at the last minute would not be able to speak. And for whatever number of years I was there, 17 years, I prepared a sermon every Sunday, even though I only used it twice a a year. And every Sunday I had a sermon in my notebook ready to speak just in case. See, the battle's won in the preparation sometimes. And I want to make sure that we are those who study, 
We read, we pray, we prepare. Matthew 25, 1 to 13, the five wise and five foolish, their opportunity was in the preparation stage. It wasn't in the final act. They seized the opportunity to prepare themselves. I want us just to meditate. It's like I don't want to move on. I want us to just stop for a minute and say, okay, Lord, how am I supposed to prepare? When the seminar is over, are there some habits I need to change? Is there, is there some way that I need to approach serving you differently that I leave more time for prayer and study and reading? And I say study, I talk the Bible. When I say reading, reading both the scriptures and then reading stories of men and women and lessons we can learn from books that are out there that people have gained insight that we don't have. I do a reading plan, and I'm not recommending it for everyone, but here's what I love about it. It's from a young man who died at the age of 29, Robert Murray McShane. You've probably heard of him. He lived in the 1800s. He lived from... I believe it was 1814 and died in 1843. But he so wanted the people in his church to read their Bibles. And this is the 1800s, and this is a 20-year-old that he developed a reading plan for every person in his church in his 20s that is still around 180 years later for us to benefit from because a young man saw the importance of studying the word of God. Praise the Lord. Give us that kind of a zeal. Colossians 4.2, devote yourself to prayer. When you pray, you become spiritually more aware. The Aramaic word for prayer is slotha, S-L-O-T-H-A. In case I'm not pronouncing them all that well, I haven't had coffee for 15 minutes. I'm not stirring up jealousy, am I, I hope? No, okay, good. Thank you, Thea, for that coffee. If you want to get mad, get mad at Thea. She's the one who brought it. <laughs> Colossians 4.2. You've just lost 12 friends, Thea, sorry. Uh, devote yourselves to prayer. When you pray... You become spiritually more aware. The Aramaic word for prayer, slotha, means to set a trap. And prayer helps us to see and catch the opportunities that others fail to, know, to notice. Slotha, pray, to set a trap. And we see things that others do not. When I pray, opportunities happen. In Zechariah 4.10, Scripture we know so well, Desp don't despise the day of small beginnings. And we want to think of every opportunity, small or large, as a gift from God. And what we do with that opportunity is our gift back to God. God gives the opportunities and we respond to it. In Joshua 15 and verse 16, and this could be my absolute favorite of the whole message, Caleb gave an opportunity. And he says, listen, I'll give my daughter Axa. She is beautiful. She is smart. She's got a heart for God. I will give my daughter Axa to the man who attacks and captures Cariath Sefer. Man, I put opportunity in all caps in that story. In other words, you can have my daughter if you attack and capture that city. I don't know what you envision. I envision every single man in the entire area charging for that city to see who can defeat it first. But we know this, that Othniel took advantage of that opportunity. He saw an opportunity and he went after it. And he got a wife who moved him to seek for a greater inheritance. He got a wife who asked for the upper and lower springs for a greater portion of the Holy Spirit. The opportunity presented itself, and he attacked, and he won that battle. I don't know how others responded. I don't know how many tried. 
but it seems to me like the opportunity of a lifetime. And Othniel went after it. In 1 Samuel 14, in verse 1, let's turn there because there's one part of it that is almost hard to understand. But some see an opportunity and some do not. Some who are spiritually aware see an opportunity when others see nothing. And in 1 Samuel 14 and verse 1, we know it's the story of Jonathan and doing a, 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 hero, a heroic deed. But it begins and it says, One day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. And he, but he didn't tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron with 600 men who were with him. Now, isn't it amazing that 600 men are sitting under a pomegranate tree? They are sitting there comfortable, and even though the Philistines are binding them, they have taken away all their weapons. If you read the last verse of chapter 13, they are being oppressed, they are weak, they are in bondage, 600 people, Saul and 600, are sitting there because they see no opportunity. They see no opportunity to break the bondage of the enemy over their lives. But one person, Jonathan, in the same position, sees an opportunity to do something. His opportunity included climbing up a cliff where the enemy had the high ground and the advantage. His opportunity included facing overwhelming odds. But there was a cause. Jonathan was a lion chaser. There was an opportunity to try and do something about it. 600 men, and I, I'll put this phrase, they were opportunity blind. They were opportunity blind to what was before them. And Jonathan is an armor bearer, and his armor bearer saw an opportunity. In Judges 3, verse 31, and let me just throw in one phrase that I skipped over because I got too excited. Prayer is an opportunity incubator. Prayer is an opportunity incubator. Causes us to th see things, experience things we would not have otherwise. But in Judges 3, in verse 31, It's one verse, the last verse of chapter 3. We know almost nothing about the man, but look what it says. After Ehud came Shamgar, the son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad, and he too saved Israel. One verse, no details. He didn't have the right weapon. He was a farmer, it appears. He took something, an instrument used in plowing to goad the cattle or oxen on to move a little faster. He was a farmer, but he had the odds of 600 to 1 against him, but he saw an opportunity to end the Philistine oppression. He saw an opportunity. He didn't have the right tool. He didn't have the right odds. He was not trained as a soldier. He was trained as a farmer, but that didn't stop him. He was driven by taking advantage of the opportunity, and he saved Israel. We see throughout Hebrews 3 and 4, a couple last scriptures. Throughout Hebrews 3 and 4, the, the oft-repeated phrase, today if you will hear his voice. It's as if the writer was saying, listen, respond to God when you have the opportunity. Seize the opportunity, whether that be obeying him, whether that be acting on something he's told you, whether that be responding to something he's asking to change in your life. Today, if you will hear his voice. Today, if you will hear his voice. Over and over again, the call is to seize the opportunities set before us today. 
I'm not worried about you responding today. And let me explain that. I'm worried about you responding next Monday. When something crosses your path and someone who needs you comes before you and it's inconvenient and you had plans and you're meeting at Starbucks for coffee with your best friend and somebody crosses your path who needs you, that's when we respond. I pray that these messages will somehow stick with us so that when the time comes and God says, what did I say? What did I say about responding today? 2 Corinthians 6, 1 in the Message Bible. It says, don't squander one bit of the marvelous life God has given us. I'd adjust it and say, don't squander one opportunity that God sets before us. Jesse Lowry, we said this yesterday, I'll say it again today. He said, the burdens of yesterday's regrets are lifted by the opportunities of today. What form do those opportunities take? Everything imaginable. It's being open. It's being men and women of prayer, realizing that God will cause our lives to intersect with others who need us, others who are broken, others who are in need, others who are desperate. God puts people in our lives on purpose so we can provide care and encouragement to them, but we have to take time to discern the opportunity. And that's a beautiful phrase, to discern the opportunity. To discern when God's calling us to act, and it takes an awareness that we often don't have. Last scripture, and we'll invite the worship team. In Mark chapter 6, There's a story of Jesus sending his disciples into a storm. And I want to read this entire little section. We've got a little bit of time. Mark 6, 45 to 56, if you want to follow along with me. Mark 6, starting in verse 45. And it says, immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go out ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land and he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And I'll just throw this out. Jesus sent them into a storm. Jesus sent them out on the lake, knowing there would be a storm, but knowing that in accomplishing his purposes, they had to go through that storm. Jesus was aware of where he was sending them. The story goes on shortly before dawn. He went out to them, walking on the lake. And there are translations that take the next phrase. The NIV says, he was about to pass them by. Other translations say, he intended to pass them by. Another one says, he meant to pass them by. But what happened was that they began to cry out. When they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they saw him and were terrified. But I want to take it and maybe a little out of context. Jesus intended to pass them by. And opportunities can pass us by. In a moment of time, like the children of Israel, like Rehoboam, Rehoboam did not get a second chance. He wanted to go to war to reunite Israel. He wanted to go to war to bring them back together. And God said, no, you missed your chance. There's not another one. And the kingdom remained divided until the rest of that era. Jesus intended to pass them by opportunities could, can pass us by if we're not looking for them. So let's pray. We're going to worship the Lord, but I want to come back and just pray, Lord, make us more aware. Amen? 
Make us more aware of the opportunities you cause to cross our path for your honor and glory. Let's stand.